Fellowship, Center for Neuroscience Zurich, it's a mini seminar and it's also supported by Life Science Zurich and, um, and, so, and, and Collegium Helveticum. Um, and I really thank Collegium Helveticum for adopting this event um, as her own and I would like uh, Gerd Forkers to introduce um, Ian and, and Jonathan. Thank you. Okay, thank you, uh, Arko. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. We are welcome to this uh, very interesting, uh, very inspiring uh, event that we have today. We will uh, hear a tandem, tandem lecture, kind of a tandem lecture of uh, two uh, persons that uh, engaged uh, deeply in a uh, rare disease uh, you have probably uh, some knowledge about. I will very shortly go into the fact why the Collegium Malveticum is uh, interested in that and uh, again I'm grateful that uh, Arco contacted me and that we could team up uh, to host here uh, tonight. Uh, our uh, ongoing project for the next five years is on reproducibility and uh, prediction and all kinds of reproducibility are the essence of uh, doing basic science. Um, so reproducibility in all kinds and aspects of uh, uh, identifying uh, yourself, uh, identifying a, uh, a unique uh, unit uh, to differentiate that from clones and uh, to describe any kind of individuality is uh, one of the questions that we uh, follow now for the next years. Um, and in, so far, uh, of course, the uh, uh, the question of uh, how the body is represented uh, in myself and uh, also the borderlines uh, when talking about myself uh, <clears throat> that I see around myself and I see in my body is one of the important questions uh, to describe individual actions, individual beings and uh, the reproducibility of, uh, of this uh, being myself. Uh, so, I think that's uh, more or less enough on our program. The Collegium Helveticum is a nice little old observatory, not very far from here. Uh, if you ever have the chance to visit university clinics, uh, make a stop over uh, at the little observatory built by Semper, just uh, 250 meters from here. This is Semper Gottfried, the famous one from the uh, Dresden Opera. Uh, who was a professor of architecture at the ATR at those times because he had to, fled, to flee from Germany for political reasons. This is uh, no longer the precondition to uh, get the job at the ATR, so uh, feel safe. Um, the uh, Collegium in itself is uh, fostering interdisciplinary research. Uh, what do we mean by interdisciplinary and transdisciplinary research? We try to do it in a bottom-up structure, that means we have the, the, the privilege to uh, elect uh, six fellows, three from universities, three from uh, ATR for a period of five years at the 20% workload, so one day per week. And we do that uh, without any respect to the disciplines. So the, the fellows are elected just by their gorgeous personality. And then after they are elected, uh, they are invited uh, to discuss one topic, one interesting topic that they want to follow for the next five years with this 20% workload. So the very essential job is in the first six months to come up with one topic and the topic of uh, this period now is this reproducibility business and you can imagine that we try to follow all kinds of uh, aspects of this reproducibility. 
they pay me enough. It's my pleasure now to introduce uh, in the order of appearance, probably, I don't know exactly, uh, Jonathan Cole. Jonathan Cole is a neurologist, uh, medical doctor, uh, is a professor and a consultant in the clinic in Poole. And he has written a wonderful book, uh, you are probably aware about uh, his collaboration and his uh, uh, insights and scientific insights uh, uh, upon the disease. The name is Bright and a Daily Marathon. And this is the story of the other protagonist of uh, tonight. It's uh, uh, Ian Waterman and uh, how to introduce uh, Ian Waterman. Ian Waterman became famous because he was sick, uh, but he has become a prominent person not because he was sick, because he was able to overcome an absolute terrible and frightening disease that divested him of control of his bodily movements and of sense of touch. And by an, we will hear that, unprecedented uh, mental exertion. He regained control and eventually taught himself to move again, as you can see. And uh, which is the result that uh, brought him here and uh, join us and being part of our discussions tonight. That's uh, amazing enough. And um, with these words, I would like to give the floor to the two gentlemen. We are happy to have you here. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you for the introduction. Thank you for the invitation to Arco. And thank you all for coming. I didn't know he had his, quite as many friends. <laughs> this, this should really have, have read Living Without Touch, Movement and Position Sense. And I, I firmly believe that as a, a doctor looking after people with neurological impairment, I have to try and understand it using empirical science as best I can, and I'm going to describe some experiments. But I also need to understand what it's like to be another person in a particular position. So I have to ask them, and I have to ask them to listen and listen and listen and tease it all out. So I ought to thank Ian for allowing me just to listen and write about not only doing science with him, but also about his experiences, which are of themselves of interest and inform empirical science, I think, but also um, science in the OED just means knowledge. And science began before empirical lab based <coughs> science, and there's still a place just for the narrative case history, I think. So off we go. What we're going to do is I'm going to give a bit of science and a bit of background, and then every so often there'll be a video to keep you awake, and then if that's not if that's too boring the videos, we're going to ask Ian to give a bit of commentary during our lecture. So it's we're going to do we're going to do neuroscience, we're going to do phenomenology live. Okay? <laughs> we hope. So here's the peripheral nervous system as it was dissected uh, in 1728. But now uh, I don't know how many of you are physiologists or neurophysiologists, I'll assume not many. But if you look at a peripheral nerve, um, there are various classes of nerve cell according to how big they are and the bigness of the nerve fibre, each individual nerve fibre, determines how fast it conducts. So there are different classes of nerve cell according to their diameter and their conduction velocity. But it just so happens that each class conducts information that gives is elaborated within the brain for the perception of different things. So the large nerve fibres, uh, sensory nerve fibres, come from muscle spindles, tendon receptors and from the skin, and they underpin the perceptions of joint position sense and muscle stretch and of touch. And movement and position sense is conventionally described as proprioception. Uh, although, of course, not all of the information about movement becomes conscious. So the, we, I prefer, in a way, to talk about movement and position sense rather than proprioception, which is a slightly ambiguous term. The small nerve fibres do the rest, which is pain 
and temperature mainly, plus a bit of tension and cramp and fatigue. Okay, so uh, Ian had an illness which we'll go into. As a result of that, from the neck down, his large myelinated nerve fibres, sensory nerve fibres, no longer work. So he doesn't have the sensations of joint position sense, movement sense, or touch from the skin alone. The collar line at the front and the back of the head at the back. We're going to have that happen. But the sensations over here were unaffected, and crucially, the movement or motor nerves were not affected at all. But without the, br the brain, without knowing where the arm is, which Ian doesn't if he has his eyes shut, the brain can't organise movement at all on its own. And quite how Ian has managed to overcome the lack of peripheral feedback is something we'll go into. Hopefully. How did it happen? Ian had a gastric infection, a virus. The virus was met by an antibody raised in the body, and that antibody then reacted against his nerve cells. And the sensory nerve cell bodies of the sensory nerves happen to be in a place here, which is the dorsal column, the dorsal uh, root ganglion, which is just outside the spinal cord. This is the back, and that's the front, so it's upside down. But that is where the damage occurred. All the each at each vertebral level, where each spinal nerve comes out and goes in, um, it happened, but not to the cranial nerves. Um, Sir Charles Bell wrote a book in 1833 which described, for the first time, proprioception or movement of posi position sense. Sherrington termed the coin proprioception, but Bell actually described um, the problem. Now, when a blind man stands upright, how does he know where he is? Uh, he has to adjust the muscles so that the limbs are stiffened. And there's no source of knowledge but a sense of the degree of exertion in his muscular frame to underpin that. He stands by such a fine expression of this power, and the muscles are so, from habit, directed with so much precision, with an effort so slight, that we don't know how he stands. Normally you don't think about standing. You're not sitting, you're not sitting now thinking about sitting. But if you don't have feedback, you have to. Normally we don't, we're not aware of what we do. Of course, if we attempt to walk on a narrow ledge or stand where we're in danger, the actions of the muscles are magnified and demonstrative to which they're excited. We're sensible to the position of our limbs. Although we touch or see nothing, there must be an internal, a property internal to the frame. And that's the internal awareness which Ian no longer has. Um, when treating the senses and showing how one organ profits by exercise of another, and each is indebted to that of touch, uh, the sensibility of the skin is most dependent of all on the exercise of another quality. Uh, without the sense of muscular action or consciousness of degree of effort, the proper sense of touch could hardly be an inlet to knowledge at all. When you put your hand in your pocket to pick out a coin, you're always doing something called active touch, you're moving in relation to the sense you get of where you are in the pocket. Most of touch is an exploratory function, that you feel what you're doing, that determines what you do next. And in 1833, Bell was immediately aware that touch enables action, and action depends on touch. The two are almost uh, impossible to separate. Uh, here's a video of a man called CF who had the condition that we're talking about, acute sensory neuronopathy. He can't move, he can't feel touch or movement or position sense below the neck. And he was 60 when it happened, uh, and you'll see him again in a, a little while. So he doesn't really know where this part of him is when he's doing that, and he's pretty well stuck. When he went out of that chair, he couldn't control what he was going to do when he hit the floor properly. He will perhaps talk about this. And this is GL, who's another subject with the same condition, only more affected in a way, because she can't feel from the lower part of the face and the whole of the neck either, um, because her level is slightly higher. There are a few patients in the world like this that we're aware of medically, and some of them are studied in the literature rather more than others. Uh, and now 
I'm going to hand over to Ian to just briefly tell you a little about what happened. Of course. All these, all these people that you're doing, these people that you showed, they all had the same problem. They all had an infection that then... So they all, yes, they, they all had an infective cause, but it wasn't always the same infection. Okay. So it might be infectious mononucleosis, um, a virus, an unknown virus, but they all had, yes. Good evening. Thank you very much for the invite. It's a pleasure to be here. It's an unusual situation for us to work together in this way. And this is, in fact, you may be delighted to hear, hopefully by the end of the evening you will be, that you know, we, we, we've chosen here to launch it. Um, but, so it may be a little bit rusty in places, but please bear with us. And please, as this lady has, ask any questions as we go through. Uh, anything, you know, for me, nothing's off limits. So while we're here, as far as I'm concerned, all questions are valid. Please ask anything you wish to know, even the silly personal ones you can ask. You know, you might not get an answer, but you have an invitation. <laughs> Started off in Jersey, uh, I'd gone over there as a young man, full of ambition to be a butcher. Maybe not an exciting life for vegetarians, but certainly it excited me. And I had a pretty good career out there. Um, got an infection. In, it presented itself as uh, the flu. Just a simple flu. I felt tired, uh, very sluggish. I went to bed. Um, I went to get up one morning to get out of bed to freshen myself up and fell out of bed. And I fell against the radiator, which was off. It was cold, because radiators are in the summer months. And I couldn't unravel myself. I couldn't immediately have stopped myself from falling out of bed. And I couldn't unravel myself from the package that I found myself in on the floor. And my landlady, I was living in a hotel at the time, and um, my landlady came in and she said, what's up? Thinking that uh, some guys at my age at that time would be drinking quite a bit. <laughs> and she thought that maybe this was an alcohol-related incident, um, which I assured her it wasn't. And um, we decided we'd call the doctor, and the doctor came out and was quickly rushed into Jersey General. And from there on, things started to deteriorate, and that I lost all connection with anything from the neck down, really. We looked at what the issues were in the Channel Islands, and it's a smashing island, a lovely place to visit, thoroughly recommend it, nice people. But they don't have the best medical situation in the world, and so we were shipped off, or I was shipped off, to, to, to Southampton. And it's only when you start getting back into the real world again, I've been six weeks in this hospital and was then shipped off to Southampton, um, that I realised uh, you know, what I'd actually started to lose, um, or what the loss was. I mean, they, they, they came in on the morning of the departure to, to, to Southampton and dressed me. I couldn't dress myself, I couldn't feed myself, I couldn't clean myself before I went to the toilet. Um, they came in and dressed me and got me in an ambulance and very kindly sat me in the corner of the ambulance and we drove off. And as we went around the first corner, the ambulance went one way and I went the other. So that was something I'd lost that I didn't even know I had. Um, and that, as Jonathan explained to me, is something called proprioception, the ability to manage those sort of things. And we ended up in, 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 in Southampton, where um, I was looked at and prodded and poked, and uh, the prognosis was pretty grim. The prognosis was that I wouldn't walk again. Um, but what also became fairly apparent was they didn't really understand what the condition was. They knew what the loss was, but they didn't understand how I got it, what the, what, what the impact was going to be long term, other than I wouldn't walk again and, you know, life was going to be resigned to a wheelchair. At the time that this information was given to me, I, you know, it's a bit of a crass statement in a way, but it's a cliche and it's a true, true one. That, you know, I, I, I really was the first disabled person I met and I wasn't very happy about it. Um, you know, I was, I was an arrogant, angry young man that suddenly having my career taken away from me and I fought long and hard not to go into the wheelchair. Um, but it seemed as though that was the way it was going to go for quite some time. Until I, I attended some physiotherapy clinics in, um, in, in the, in, in the neuro, neuro centre in Southampton. But eventually was signed off and shipped home to be with my parents and I spent uh, quite a considerable amount of time with my parents at home. Uh, we moved the bed downstairs, and I couldn't manage stairs and get around very easy, so that was an easy, easy hit. Um, but I thought, well, we need to do something a little bit more long term 
let that push you to Oddstock. And Oddstock really is where I started to explore what I had. I started to learn to stand. I started to learn to balance. And when I say I started to learn to stand, um, my physiotherapists were very good at building up muscle strength and giving me exercises to be able to do that. Which was great, but that really wasn't a problem. It was the controlling of my muscles. Now, if my eyes were closed, I couldn't do things. If I was trying to feed myself, not that we do generally feed ourselves with our eyes closed, but um, you know, my hand would wander. If I was distracted during the conversation, uh, with the conversation during eating, my hand would wander off. So I started to learn that I would have to attend to all movement if I wanted to control it and not only be safe by myself, but not spill things over people that happen to be sat next to you. Um, so, you know, I started to explore off stock, and we started there um, learning to balance. And I, I, I was put in front of some wall bars, we're familiar with those, we have them in schools and gyms and wherever. And I literally spent hours in front of that just learning to stand. Just standing. I had my wheelchair here, I had the bars in front of me, I put my brakes on, and I learned to stand. And it took a long time before I could actually stand and stand safely. Well, I was pretty pleased with that. I thought that was quite an achievement. My physios thought, well, let's just leave him to his own devices. He seems quite happy. He's less trouble that way. So they let me practice my standing. But once I'd learned to stand, I wanted to explore doing other things. And no one had told me that if you stick an arm out, you're actually slightly inclined to one side to take up the... You know. I didn't do physics. So I found this out for myself. As soon as I put an arm out, I fell over. And very soon learned that one would have to start controlling all sorts of things I hadn't even been aware of. That some other system inside me had taken control of and, and looked after since I was a top. And I built up as I tumbled and falls and fallen as a little, little babe. You know, you, you learn all these things, but that had gone, and I now had to put those in place. And what I put, what I replaced it with was vision and cognitive effort. And the simple act of standing never has been simple again. It's something that I have to think about. Sitting in a chair, we sit in our chairs and we're quite comfortable. And we're hopefully absorbed in the lecture. But um, you know, for me, if I you know, became distracted, I'd probably fall out and maybe you know, end up on the floor. So you know if I fall asleep, I won't know if you do, if you're probably set, you will keep you in place. But I'm not quite sure which is the next slide that's coming up, but I think it might be something around movement and standing. Yeah. Let's, let's move on and have a look. I remember tensing very, very much the tummy muscles and, and just sort of sitting up and I would fold up in the middle and just never get anywhere. But after a lot of practice and a lot of, uh, a lot of effort, I actually learned this technique to just sort of like lift the head, move the shoulders forward and sit up. I remember vividly the first time I sat up, I was so euphoric, I lost all control and, and, and almost fell out of the bed again because I just lost control about keeping the tummy muscles tight and all that sort of thing. And that simple act of sitting up in bed was the key um, to how movement was going to have to be if it was going to be controlled for the rest of my life. That I would have to plan it before I did it. That I'd have to structure it in my mind and work my way through it. And that's how it is today. It hasn't changed. And it hasn't, if you can stop there please, John. It, it, it hasn't changed. I still have to apply those strategies today. When I sit up in bed in the morning, you know, I have to think about where things are moving. I would do that by moving the leg and feeling something cold. Uh, I think, oh, that leg must have been in that position. And you, you, you know, by a method of you know, subtraction and, 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 and effort, you, you work out where you are and you start to, to piece things together and immediately you then start to sit up. But the process that I found here and explored here is exactly the same today. It's a little more subtle um, and hopefully it's you know, not, not quite as obvious and late as it used to be, but it's the same principle. And that's how I manage movement. Everything has to be planned through and you know, managed with eyesight. So I will send the command. I'm pretty arrogant, so I believe it's going to do it. If I tell it to do it, usually it does. But I have to monitor and make sure with, with vision. I'm not sure which picture goes on to. Been doing shoelaces, took years. Hey. Talking about
about a year to stand. And he spent hours doing like jigsaw puzzles. He would might stand as well. <laughs> paper clips, anything to improve dexterity. Uh, this is Charles Freed again. But all these simple tasks, such as doing the bike, sitting up, all these things take cognitive effort. And this is Charles being assisted by one of the chaps out there. And I used to walk in a similar sort of fashion, but it took years to get to that sort of stage to do it on that, you know, on AD. It took me a year to learn to stand and work out what the virtues were of standing. Um, it sounds crazy now, but it was a year well spent, I think. I had many years of walking around. Just get steady, be happy. The surprising the amount of effort goes right into these simple tasks and doing the button, giving something out of your pocket. There's you know, some things I never do. Okay. I never get things out of my pocket. I'll you know, you know, ask Jonathan, he pays for everything. I'll take you, know, you know, there are some things that you let go of and work out very quickly, which it's easy to let go. Getting things out of pocket's not a big issue. Standing and being independent, absolutely crucial to me. I spend a lot of time doing that. It seems like it is lifting. Okay, we'll lean over. The reason for that, Charles, I'll show you for just a second. The reason it's not lifting. I used to walk long distances, and I'm not very gracefully. Uh, a lot of effort going into it, but, you know, I was mobile and can still walk now, but I get, I get back there quite chronically now, so that, that's the issue I'm not staying. But I was trying to get, get Charles to, to learn about shifting his weight and thinking about where he was going and what he wanted to do. Planning. Well, one of the things that people without feedback get is a taxi, and you can see Charles is shaking and unsteady in what he does, everything he does. One of the first things Ian had to learn was how to stop a taxi. I'll, I'll do the next video, which is you walking. Okay. Right. The, one of the problems I had in doing fine dexterous tasks was that my hands would wander a phenomenal amount. They would, they would shake and they would never go where I wanted them to go. And so I set myself some tasks of trying to learn to control what was there. And I could control it with vision. So I would spend many hours, literally many hours, touching my nose, touching my knee, touching my nose, touching my knee. And I built a rhythm in doing this. And we, we, you know, we just worked and worked at it. Then I would put another object in that corner, this one, that one, that, and monitoring it and watching it the whole way through. And it was only by learning what virtues I had and had left, and left to play with that I was able, and how I needed to manage them, that I was able to control it and be much more dexterous today. Charles um, asked us about, you know, if he could learn to do a couple of tasks. One of the things he wanted to do is to learn to do buttons. And um, so we, we, we had an exercise, we did have some film of that, I don't think it's with us today, but we, we spent some time learning how to do buttons. I don't know if you've got the paper clip one, but we also spent some time learning how to do paper clips. And it was very simple once you broke it down to what you were trying to do. And when Charles was trying to, to, to work with his paper clips, his hands were, were moving quite, quite vigorously. Um, he was trying to grasp with all his hands and fingers and everything was getting in the way and he clearly wasn't focused. We did a simple thing of putting a metronome, he's passionate about music. So we worked with what he liked, he liked music, and we put a metronome out there which went to a beat. And we got him to work with a beat. And that was very simple. He went from here to here to here. And he did it like that. He got it very, very quickly. Just because we put a focal point there. And when we got the focal point there, and he was more focused, he was then able to manage and control what he wanted to do. And so, when we gave him some paper clips, his hands were moving all over the place, trying to thread them together. 
And what we did, or what I did, was I got him to put his hands down on the corner of the box, I think it was, and we put all the other fingers away that he didn't need, and we just worked with, with finger and thumb, and we worked with those, and we got him to thread all paper clips, and he was doing it in a very, very short space of time. Something that he hadn't been able to do for a long time. And it was all because we stripped it down to its bare essentials and got him to focus while we did it. While we were doing this, plainly over, he was distracted and his hands all over the place again. So as soon as you let go of that, that focus of what you want to do, then you know, it goes out the window. It's as fragile as that. For myself, if, you know, I can be <laughs> whatever normal is, you know, I, can, I can go back my normal day and you know, do my you do whatever I need to do, but if I have a cold or a headache or I'm particularly, you know, a bit run down or whatever, then I lose the edge. I constantly live at the peak of what I can do because I, uh, that's the way I am. Sorry, please. I have a question. How, how can you split your consciousness? How can you focus on one question. Um, you break it down into things that you can, you, you apportion certain things. For example, to be here, sat in a chair, I know that I'm in the chair, I know how far I can lean without getting into a dangerous position. So I've learned that because I've fallen out a fair few times. So that's something that you would learn. So that's something I, can, I, I, I have and I attend to it. While I'm talking to you, I'm still attending to how far I'm leaning over. I gesture a lot, you may have noticed, you know, there are not that many of them, but I throw them around. You know, but I do move a fair bit, but I'm always aware as to how far I can go with that. So that's something I've learned. That's one piece of the picture that I'm presenting, so that's one bit. Um, as for the gesture, um, we have lots of debates about that, funnily enough, but I have um, a repertoire of movements that I like, of gestures that I like. There are a lot of automatic ones in there. But there are quite a few sweeping gestures that I do. But when you think about those, that's easy, because that's, you know, it's just an act, really, because there's no fine end point. If I was doing something like stopping to touch a fine point or to do something dexterous, I would then start attending to that. I will never move and while I was trying to do that. So you start breaking it down to things that you, you need to attend to. I mean, someone very kindly came in with a, with a, with a bottle head. I would never do that and sort of have a hand there and a hand here and have a chat and what have you. Now that's just, it gets messy. It gets messy. So you learn to apportion. Um, if you were to watch, you know, it's a boring thing to do, but if you were to watch a video, you'd see that the, the gestures are very, very limited. They're just, they're just structured in a way that they're not precise. Jonathan had a very good chat on that. Do you want to that one? It's not quite next. <laughs> it's not quite next. It's not quite next. We'll come on to a bit about gesture. Um, in terms of movements, uh, Jacques Payard and Robert Forget, I put this slide up, find morphokinetic movements, it's a shape of a movement, which doesn't have to be accurate in place. So it's, it, it can be accurate in time and it can be accurate in shape, but it doesn't have, have to be accurate in place, like picking something up, as Ian said. Top, morphokinetic movements are relatively easy, but if you have to go to a place in, ex, in, the, in the external world, that's requires much more thought for Ian, and um, we did an example with GL and Ian when, when they were together, and you can see that GL is very good at writing Ian's name with her eyes open, and she can write all the shapes with her eyes shut, but she doesn't think, she doesn't think to move her hand across the page with her eyes shut, because she hasn't really got that that's what she needs to do. The morphokinetics are there, but the topokinetics are not. And we did the same with Ian, and Ian's very awkward, because he knew what we were doing, so he, he slowed down sufficiently that he could preserve going across the page properly. So we had to make him either really slowing, so he got the tea on, off the paper, or really fast. And even then, he got all the going across the page properly, and only really came unstuck when he had a the end of a certain phrase that he was making. So there's two sorts of movements that Jack Payard suggested that shed some light on it. Um, Ian talked about walking, and the, the purpose of this slide is to show you how long we've been working together. 
And this is me um, with all the abilities, all the, all the EMG, and there are also small infrared sensors, such that you get sticks. Um, and these are shoulder, hip, knees, foot, from the side on as someone walks. And I'm there, and Ian's here, and I'm not that normal either, but I'm roughly normal, because I'm not it. But these are to show the differences that Ian has in his walking, which are that he has to, we'll show Ian walking in a minute, um, he has to lean further forward to see his head during, so his head can see his body, sorry, uh, during walking. So his trunk isn't as vertical as you and I, and he won't trust his weight to be borne on a bent knee, so he has to have a straight leg. Um, he doesn't rise up on his ankle because verticality is a problem and he doesn't trust his ankle properly. So he lifts off more from the foot and he lands more on the foot than you and I do. Uh, and in order so that to avoid tripping over his toes when he's on the through foot, through phase of walking, he has to abduct the hip. Um, sorry, you can't see the abduct from the hip. From the front. From the front. Yeah. <laughs> From the front. Uh, that's me trying to be normal with the foot extending in front of me in one line. And that's Ian bending his knee outwards so that he can turn his foot outwards so he can see it and not trip up on it. I would say slightly like Chaplin. And Yesterday we, you said very like Chaplin. Well, uh, I mean, it wasn't there then. <laughs> Thank you, Kevin. Rather like Chaplin. <laughs> This is Ian walking, and he might walk you, talk you through this. We just happen to be at NASA filming. Not the most elegant of walks in the world, but um, it worked for me. It still does work for me. Um, quite a lot of effort going into it. You have to monitor what's happening all the time. Um, from the standing, you'd be monitoring the head where you're going. It's like a chess game, you can't play chess, but it's as I imagine a chess game would be. You are planning ahead constantly. Fairly easy when there's nothing ahead of you, and you've got a film crew by the side, everybody gets out of your way. It's rather difficult if you're trying to do it in a busy railway station, and you're late for the work that you're trying to get to that day. An athlete will train and train and train for certain competitions. And that's their peak, and that's what they strive for. I'll look at my peak every day. It sounds dramatic and almost an over the top statement, but it's not. I, I live at the edge, for want of a better term, all day, every day. There's no leeway. The simplest of actions continue to carry. Shopping becomes an exercise in mechanics. Swedes are quite funny. Sometimes they're, really, they're a good size, but they can be really heavy, or quite light. Quite strange beasts, I think. And that can do an awful lot to your balance. I'll get into a safe position for my feet. I'll freeze my legs quite rigidly so that I know they're not going to move around a lot. Freeze the upper torso a little bit so that I'm in a safe, good, rigid position. I can now start hanging off of that frame other movement. But I have to be aware that it's a heavy object. And the law of physics says that if you have a heavy object outstanded from a narrow base, you're going to topple over. So you actually have to think, or I have to think consciously, about what picking up that object is going to do to this framework. To make it easy, we went on twigs. You know, which I didn't disgrace myself, as I just did here, picking up a drink and spilled that over myself. But, um, yeah, I mean, simple tasks of shopping, you have to plan ahead. You know, you have to have a fair bit of energy uh, to be able to take on the task. And I think a little bit about coping with disability, it took me a long time to accept that there would be some days when I just didn't want to go shopping. I may have a bare cupboard at home, um, but there were some days when I just didn't have the energy to go around the supermarket. And I would get very angry with myself about that. But you have to be kind to yourself as well. I'm very hard on my harshest critic, but you also have to be kind to yourself. In that, there are going to be days when you can't do it. And you have to accept that. But as long as those are fewer than those when you can do it, it's not a bad thing. You know, but you know that, 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 that took a lot of learning. That that little bit of a little bit of thing. But um, yeah, I mean, standing and, 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 and moving and carrying weights and all that uh, a big problem. I remember once being compromised. I, I bumped when I worked in, a, in an office. I worked, worked once for the civil service in the, in the UK, and uh, 
I met my boss in the car park and he thrust in my handle towards me you know, some papers in the briefcase and said, can you just take those into the office for me? It was blowing me again and raining. It wasn't the best environment in the world and I was in quite a difficult position, but I didn't want to let myself down. I was exhausted having to think about all this extra weight and wind and what have you. It's not a given um, and it's easier than it used to be, but it's nowhere as easy as it is for you chaps. Okay. Can, can you say something about the it? Yeah. <laughs> or bottle or whatever, because clearly there are many things where you've got to have the compliance in our case that you don't have. Well, to pick up drinks to, to, to know that you have to put this amount of effort in. So. I'll tell you a story. <laughs> I was at the ice to work in an office, and there was a very nice lady that worked there called Hillary. And she, I've been trying to engage her in conversation for a long time, but believe it or not, I was a little bit shy. She was wandering past, going to a drinks machine, and said, would you like a drink? Yes, please. And she came back with a hot chocolate and a coffee, and she sat down, we were having a conversation, and she said to me, you're not drinking your drink. And my reason was, though I didn't tell her, I was worried about picking it up because the cup was one of those soft plastic cups that was very fragile. And I knew it was going to be a problem. And I thought, well, I can't make her think that she's wasted her time. So I did a stupid thing and went to pick it up and spilt it. And we had a long conversation while she mopped it up and was very kind to me. But what I did was I picked up some of those empty cups and went home that evening and practiced and learned how to pick them up without embarrassing myself which was to find a drink and someone would present a drink to you. I had never, or very, very rarely, taken a drink from anybody's hand. I was asked them to put it on the table. I'm then in control. I am a control freak. I then put my hand out. I will freeze a position with my, with my hand, and I know that I can do that, and it's not going to crush the cup. As I lift my hand, the cup will settle into it, and I can then freeze that posture and have a chat. But I have to monitor all the way up. It's, a, it's a, a little ballet of movement, really, and then you watch where it is, you, you observe, you work out what you want to do, you watch yourself doing it, you monitor it out, you monitor it back, and you put it back and spill. A few moments ago, I just spilled my water in spite of that because I was listening to what Jonathan was saying. You know, such a dangerous fellow he is. <laughs> but does that help? Does that, is that so everything you calibrate. Yeah, basically, yeah. So tomatoes, eggs. Yep. I, 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 I keep rare breeds of poultry, so I work with eggs quite a lot of the time. And um, two days ago, I dropped the first one that had a chicken in it, and I was mortified that I, I killed a chick unnecessarily because of my clumsiness. And it is very, very rare that I will be clumsy. But I know what the virtue is of an egg and a tomato and an apple and you know you're applying thought processes to how much effort do I need to put in to slice the apple or, or, or to cut bread or, or what have you. you know, so there's a, a lot of things going along in background as well as the positioning so you don't stretch over too far and cut I mean I used to be a butcher for many years and you know my, my disability denied that career path for me um, but I recently we, we, we now keep pigs on the farm and, you know, we now butcher our own pigs again, so I've learned how to manage. You know, we don't do it in quite the same way as I used to, or as quick as I used to. Could never make a career move out of it again. But we can actually butcher our own meat now, which is you know, I, I, I was quite pleased to be able to do. So there is one instance where you you are not so much in control. It's when you shake the tongue. Yes. And you do that rather well. That's <laughs> true. <laughs> so how, how is that? Um, well, you, you see someone approaching you, you know, the one, shaking hands isn't too difficult because you, you know that quite often there's a, there's a force from them that can throw you off balance, so you just tense up for it. It's much easier when you're sitting down because it's very hard to be pulled over in October. It's very difficult when you're standing and someone comes up and, and shakes your hand. The worst one, you, as long as you're planning, as long as you're aware of it coming up, you can tense at the right time and, and, and shake your hand and be quite effective, hopefully. Um, where it becomes difficult is someone comes along and says, oh, well, help done, and pats you on the back, and you didn't sort of 
over you go. You know, I mean that, that that's where you're you're not in control. But I would very rarely put myself in a position where I couldn't get out. So if I go to eat in a restaurant, I'll make sure I have a table near the door so that I'm not going to get boxed in by the time I want to leave. Um, and then I would, if I was at a party, I would be in an area where I'm less likely to be bumped or not, or I'll be sat down. You know, so you, you know, you lose spontaneity with this with, with this gift, <laughs> but you 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 know there are conversations, but it, you know you can get around. You, know, you can you can overcome them. There are ways around it. It's a very good question, and my technical partner has a very good answer. <laughs> yeah. There's a bit of data, if we get to it, about functional imaging during Ian doing a simple task. Uh, I think Ian uses several things. He rehearses activity in his mind again and again and again, and that's the visual modality thing. When he's thinking about doing something, he imagines doing it. How do you imagine it? You, you visualise it as well. There's some evidence that the act of visualising it allows him to fasten on to how to do it in some way. But he doesn't always know what he intends to do is actually going to happen. So he has to presume that's the case and he needs some sort of feedback to make sure it's running and he wants it to. And he uses, I say he, I, we talk about visual supervision rather than visual feedback, because visual feedback can only be updated three times a second, roughly it's too slow to guide action. And there's, there's some evidence for that. It differs between GL who's much, and Charles, who, who are slower, who tend to use online visual feedback. So they tend to guide themselves through the world more slowly. Whereas Ian is running the forward programs, which he's had to think about and elaborate. But what's difficult to to really get at is although he has these programs he rehearses, he doesn't have skills the way you and I do, so that he never has automatic programs he doesn't have to think about. So it's a slightly different situation, which hopefully we'll do, there'll be some data on. Um, one of the intriguing things was when Ian picks up a, a weight, a, say a container, how, how does he know how heavy it is? Um, and we've done some work on that. If, if Ian's hand is on something, and uh, therefore he's not making any effort, I can put a huge weight on him without him knowing how heavy it is, because he doesn't have the perception in the skin or in the subcutaneous tissue of pressure like that. But as soon as the hand is not supported, he will begin to feel something. Uh, his liminal difference for a weight being heavier or lighter is about 100% and yours is 5% with eyes shut if I put a weight on your arm. So he's got some awareness, and to be honest, he's got some small receptors that may tell him about tension or something. But as soon as you put a big weight out here, his posture will move, and his neck will be alerted to it, and his inner ear will be. So it's really difficult to separate the head segment receptors, which are completely normal, from the peripheral receptors here, unless you do it at a finger, and then he's really hopeless. It's more interesting what happens when um, you can see the, the object but you don't know how heavy it is. And this is the situation we did with GL, and that's Jacques Payard, sorry, in front. Um, and we've got different weights which are concealed here, and there are liminal differences of 5%. And each time Jeanette picks up a weight, these Plato specs stop her seeing it. So then she's really bad at it. She's 100% like he is. But when she sees it, she's about 5%. So how does she do that? But what she does is she makes a certain movement that she's learned. She can make that movement. And then it's how far she goes and how fast her arm moves. And if it's a slow weight, it doesn't go as far and it goes slower. So she's observing her arm move visually to see whether it's heavier or lighter. So her perception of the arm moving is available to us, so we should be able to say whether the weight's heavy or lighter by observing her lifting up the arm. And we did that, and um, we had Jeanette doing that, and a group of 
chaps round here with a clipboard deciding whether or not weight A, B or C was heavier or lighter. Uh, and GL lifted the weight up and did this. And then she put the weight down. And I was pretty good at the perception because I knew what she was doing. But I asked her, okay, you do that and you can judge whether that's further or faster than the previous one. But why don't you do all the other movements? Because I thought you've lost your reference by then. I said, oh yes, I do that to make the judgment. I do all the others to confuse you lot. <laughs> <laughs> so that's how they can get round something like that. Um, one of the, immediately Charles Bell, coming up to him, uh, he asked whether the condition of the muscles, movement and position feedback, came purely from the muscles or came from consciousness of the degree of effort directed to them in the will. Uh, 1833, in neuroscience, we're still trying to explore the extent to which peripheral feedback guides action and the extent to which efferents copy or awareness of the motor program we're sending out guides action. Some suggest one thing, some suggest the other. Uh, one of the first things we did with, with Ian um, was to ask him just with the finger, go underneath this towel, Ian, put your finger on a strain gauge, press down a certain amount to keep it there, without knowing how much force and without knowing what was going on under, under there. Just do it. Because John Rothwell and his group had found a, a subject with a neuropathy, a pan-sensory neuropathy, so not as selective as Ian's, but um, he was asked to make a position or a force at the fingers, and as soon as the vision is removed, uh, two or three seconds after, because there's a motor memory of two or three seconds, he goes up or down and he's not aware of it, whereas you and I can maintain it, because we have peripheral feedback. So we did it with Ian, he was able to do this. Uh, we actually gave up after three minutes. He can do that. And we're still not entirely sure how. But recently, we've got some evidence from this experiment that there may be some central perception of force or effort. The experiment is to press down with the thumb hard here on a cantilever thing so that you press down and this weight goes up uh, around 500 grams and then you have to decide how hard you're pressing and press the same with the other side so you match one side with the other and then what we did with Ian was we fatigued the muscle and by fatigue we fatigued it so it was weak and we fatigued the muscles so hard it was only half as strong as it was to start with. And then we asked Ian, your muscle is really half as strong, so how much matching weight do you think it should be on the other side? And the answer for Ian is when his muscle is half, half as strong as it should be, he's actually, he matches it with double the weight on the other side. Controls do the opposite. When they're fatigued, they match it with a lesser weight on the other side. When they've got a tired muscle, they think the weight that muscle is, is having to lift is less, whereas Ian thinks it's twice as heavy. And we interpret that, that a fatigued muscle, the muscle fibres are fatigued, but the muscle spindles are fatigued too. And that in control subjects, they're tending to use the peripheral muscle spindle input to tell them how hard they're pressing, how hard the muscle's working. Whereas Ian, without that spindle input, is actually monitoring how hard he's having to press. And because the muscle is half as, half as uh, strong now, because it's fatigued, he thinks he's having to put twice as much effort into it. Um, did, so, Ian, did you feel mentally fatigued when doing that task? Can I be perfectly honest? Yes. Yeah. I can't remember it. Yeah, uh, <laughs> <laughs> One of the problems when you're a guinea pig is that you do a lot of this stuff, and it's fascinating. You love it, you know it. It's great. And I, you know, if ever you invite me to do something like this, I will do it enthusiastically. But as I say to all the researchers that we ever work with, that I ever worked with, um, I will give you 100, 110%, absolutely. But when I leave the door and go out the room, I will forget it completely. 
that's not in rude or ignorance or I don't care. It's just I've got a lot of other things on my mind, like how am I going to get down the corridor and where's the nearest coffee? <laughs> so I tend to forget this stuff, you know. Um, I'm a little more interested than I used to be, because some of this stuff has become painful over the years. So you start to engage a little more than you used to. You know, when I first used to go and see Jonathan, let, let's go back a step further. Why did I choose to work with Jonathan? Um, and he can leave the room now for two minutes while I, you know, wax lyrical about him. But I hadn't seen um, a neurologist for 11 or 12 years. 11 or 12 years. And I'd had a bad back, and my doctor said to me, go and see a neurologist. Went to the neurology department.